So it's a pleasure for me to introduce you Herbert Soron. He is uh, he's very well known for his work in systems biology, uh, markup language. He has also developed Telurix recently. And he's a developer of very good programs uh, for systems biology. Let me just introduce a little bit of, of his background. He's Welsh. He studied in Canterbury. Uh, biochemistry, and then uh, did the master in computational biology in York, the PhD in Oxford, uh, the first postdoc in Edinburgh, then he worked in Caltech, and finally he is an uh, associate professor in Washington University. Full professor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Full professor in Washington University. So. Thanks very much. Yeah, I keep forgetting to. Second time in Barcelona. Um, the last time was maybe 20 years ago, probably before that even. So it's been a while since I've been here. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm from Seattle. Uh, I have an unusual background. Uh, I was a biochemist, microbiologist, zero quantitative education, of course, when you do biochemistry, microbiology. Um, but I had a thing about computers and then modeling at the time. So, just need to switch the slide for the screen. Okay. Oh, you. Oh, yeah. Just um, up up here. Yeah. Oh, you got it anyway. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I did a master's in computational biology, so I could get some math and um, in computing. And then I did a PhD with David Fell uh, on metabolic control analysis. So. And then lots of stuff happened, and some of you, I told you what happened to me in the subsequent years. It's an interesting uh, uh, history, um, but I finally got back into science, and so now I'm, I'm a full professor at UW in bioengineering. So I just thought I'd start by you know, outlining some of my areas of interest. Um, I mean, I've been a modeler, interested in modeling you know, since, since I was an undergraduate. And, and I still do, and I've two, currently got two big modeling projects on the EGFR signaling network in cancer cells that's funded by the NCI. Uh, and I work with uh, Steve Wiley, who's a big experimentalist, and they have a, access to a large proteomic facility, and so we get lots of data on proteomic information to help uh, build and calibrate the models. They're actually rather difficult models to build signaling networks because, and this is a theme that has come up quite often in this week is the level of uncertainty. And uh, I'm not going to talk about uncertainty, though, but it's an area, it's something we have to confront full on, um, especially when you're trying to model, you know, very complex systems. I mean, the physicists really have it easy, right? Inclined planes, pendular, I mean, you know, spherical cows, I mean, it's much easier. Um, we have to deal with, you know, large complex networks. Uh, the other big modeling project is uh, we're trying to build a whole genome kinetic model of a Pseudomonas bacterium, at least the linearized version of it. The idea is to get at the flux control coefficients to, inf to tell the engineers which enzymes they should be modulating. So I'm working with a bunch of metabolic engineers, and they need to know which genes to modulate in order to re-engineer the organism. So we're trying to build a kinetic model that will let them know what to re-engineer. Um, the side sort of topic I do is theory, because my, my PhD was largely theoretical work in metabolic control analysis, and I still have a, a fond uh, fondness for theory. And I think it's a really important area because it helps you understand your models. I realized early on when I was running simulations that I still didn't understand how the model worked. Obviously, the computer knew, but I didn't because you know, you ran a simulation, you get all these curves, and I couldn't figure out, well, why is it doing that? And so I realized I had to turn to some theory to, to do that. And, I mean, it's called metabolic control analysis, but it's basically small signal analysis, the kind of thing that electrical engineers do. And then the other big area is um, software, because we all, you know, some of us have a bug. We, like, get endorphin rushes when we write software. Coding is a bit of a... Um, uh, it's, it's something, you know, when you start, you can't stop. So I, I, I still write software. And we have some uh, major software platforms we distributed we distribute, uh, in Python and C++. And those of you who are interested, our, basically our coding is in C, C++, Python, and a bit of Julia. That's basically what we do. 
Now today, though, I'm going to talk about the standards, reproducibility, and credibility area. And this is an area uh, I got in. I, I'll give you a bit of actually history. Actually, now it's well. Have, yeah, let me. Um, basically, I'm going to talk about that. So I'm not going to touch the other the other topics. So I was asked to look at the posters, and one of the things uh, I spotted was there was, as far as I can tell, there was zero mention of the fair principles that are. That is a European invention, right? And it's seeped over to the US, and we have it now over there, and I think it's a great idea. And it was surprised that uh, um, at a virtual human, physiological human conference, there was no mention of fear. In fact, there's no mention of standards at all. I don't think anywhere in the posters, which is interesting. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with FAIR, they have this, it's a very nice acronym, FAIR, okay? Um, and it stands for findable access findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. It's mainly tailored towards data, but many of these apply to models as well. And uh, for example, can I find a model online if I want to use it? Uh, is it accessible to me? Can I actually, if I do find it, can I actually use it? Uh, can I use the model with something else? Um, can I actually reuse the model in my research? So these sort of ideas apply as well to model. Now I would, for this talk, I would add an extra three, and that is, um, this is specifically to modeling, I suppose. Uh, is your model reproducible? And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, this morning. Is your model understandable? Right? And, is your, and this is a new idea, is your model actually even credible? Okay. So actually, I could summarize this. So in terms of reproducibility, can I recreate what you did? Well, that's basic scientific method. Uh, can I understand what you did and why you did it and so on? And can I actually trust the model? And maybe not so important, and maybe in academic models, but certainly if your model ends up in the clinic, this is something you, know, you want to think about, whether you're going to unleash this on a patient. And you want to know, the clinician wants to know whether I, they can trust the model or not to make you know, predictions. Uh, and, I, and there's another theme that's been running through the talks as well about this tension between machine learning and mechanistic modeling. And it's a conversation that's growing in the US and I think it's a conversation that's happening here as well. Um, we're you know, moving headlong very quickly into the machine learning AI world. Or even I use chat G GPT and my 13-year-old does as well. My 11-year-old started to. Um, What's interesting about the machine learning world is they sort of bypass the middle bit, and they go straight, straight from reproducible, so in some sense, to credible, without without stopping at the understandable. And the question is, and it's something for you all to think about, um, is you know how important is it to understand what's happening in our models? Uh, if you have an AI at a at a hospital that's you know giving giving suggestions for treatment, is it important that we know why it's telling us what it's telling us? Now, to the pol probably to the politicians and even to the people on the street, it doesn't matter. If it cures cancer, it cures cancer. I don't care <laughs> whether I, it's, I understand why it's telling me this or not, right? So there's a, there's a bit of an issue. Many of us will want to understand why it prescribes a particular treatment, but to somebody where it's a life or death situation, it doesn't matter at all, right? So. Anyway, so this is a theme that's run through the, the week as well and something to think about and something I've been thinking about as well. And, I was just, and I've mentioned this to a couple of people. One of my last grant reviews, the last reviewer, uh, they said, uh, why are you using dated uh, mechanistic modeling? Why aren't you using AI machine learning? So even amongst our own peers, there's sort of feelings that we should forget about mechanistic modeling and just go straight to machine learning, but anyway. So a little bit of history then. Um, so I arrived in the US uh, in about 2000, just for two years, and then I stayed another 23. <laughs> it often happens, I think, with people who move to the US. Uh, back in 1988, 1999, uh, there weren't many modeling tools, probably a handful of them, and, but the modelers were pretty serious, and they were complaining that uh, they couldn't move their models between the tools, okay? And there are various reasons for that. One is, you know, one tool could want, do one thing good and the other tool could do another thing good and they, were, they wanted to be able to move them about so they could use the different features and the different tools. Uh, plus, of course, you know, in hindsight, there's the, what most of those tools at that time have gone. In fact, this is um, a general 
property of academic software, it has a very, very high turnover rate or very short shelf life, maybe no more than three or four or five years, and then it's gone. And if you are dependent on that platform and it uses some kind of proprietary format, you're, you're, you're left alone and you, you can't move your model or your data or whatever to, the, to another platform. So that was another issue. And so we started talking about, okay, well, maybe we should come together, a bunch of us, and come up with some kind of format, an exchange format. And uh, it's interesting that another group was thinking of the same thing. And somebody mentioned Kitano, I think, yesterday, uh, as one of the initial people in systems biology. And he got an unusual grant from the Japanese government, uh, a Narato grant. These grants were sort of, uh, here's some money, do something grant. I don't get many of those kinds of grants. Uh, and he decided to spend some of the money in the US to try to develop an exchange uh, format. And um, this is where uh, this exchange format, which we now call SPML, uh, arose. So it's called the Systems Biology Markup Language. Now, what the big surprise to me was how it just blew up after that. Um, I mean, we, we, we developed the specification, we produced some, some uh, software development help for people, and then suddenly everybody started using it, and people started thinking, oh, now that we have a standard, I can do new things. And one of the first things that happened was a model repository. So the minute you have some common exchange format, people start, you know, we're, we're like magpies. We like to collect, you know, the bird, we like to collect things. And people started collecting models in model repositories. So that was the first thing. And then we heard about ontologies yesterday. People started developing new ontologies to describe those models. Uh, and then people started thinking about, but hey, you know, I've got the model, but I'd like to describe in some independent way how to run the simulation experiments. So all sorts of, all sorts of things happened. And the other thing that happened was an organization appeared called Combine, um, which is the website there. Uh, it's pretty active. There's two meetings a year. There's a conference, and then there's a hackathon. Um, what's interesting about this effort is it's very grassroots. So it's people like yourselves who basically drive this forward. All right. Now, some of us, of course, write grants to get the money, but people like yourselves actually do the work and actually push the field forward. And uh, that was, I think that's why it was, it was successful as it was, because <coughs> it was driven by young people who uh, could see the benefits and wanted to uh, move it forward. Um, so, you know, sort of in a nutshell, what, do, what is it for? I mean, some of you may know already this, already know this already, but I wanted to cover it because there was, there's, the posters had very barely any mention of standards, so I thought I'd better mention this. Um, but it's a machine-readable format. So all these exchange formats are machine-readable, okay? So they're not really for humans to read. Uh, they're really for machines. And the domain in this case is biochemical reactions, although it's expanded since then. It uses XML. That was the in thing back in 2000. Now maybe you do it in JSON or YAML or something. Um, but you can translate it to these other formats. And the other important thing about SPML was it tried to describe the natural biological concept. It wasn't describing a mathematical model, a finished mathematical model. It basically just described the, the entities, the biological entities, and some of the, the rules that govern the properties of those entities. It was then up to a compiler to actually turn that into a real model. And this turned out to have some significant advantages. Um, a lot of Tools now use it, including uh, companies like MATLAB and Mathematica and so on. So, um, uh, and there are large repositories now as well, and I'll mention those shortly. So this is a basic structure of an SPML model. It's pretty simple. Um, units, compartments, species, parameters, rules, and reactions, and that's the end. That's basically the core, okay? That's the core. Um, now, as I said, uh, SPML basically describes the biological form, but biological constructs, and that turned out to be useful because now we can, we can convert that into some target language, like Python, MATLAB, Julia, or whatever. But not only that, we can target different mathematical uh, endpoints. So we could generate an ODE model from it. We can generate a stochastic model, a stoichiometric model, a graph model and things that have yet to be invented. So this is one of the great, one of the significant advantages of, of 
doing it this way. It hadn't occurred to us at the time, but in the, uh, now thinking about it, this is the, the way to do it. And there are efforts underway, for example, to produce exchange standards for multicellular models. And I've been trying to persuade them, you know, focus on the biology, because in the multicellular modeling world, there are so many different approaches to actually implementing, you know, agent-based model. You don't want to fix the approach in the exchange standard. You want the exchange standard to describe the biology and then let a comp some kind of compiler convert it to whatever formalism, mathematical formalism, you think is most appropriate. Okay. Now, after that, so that I've just basically described the core, but after that, a whole bunch of extensions developed called packages. And the ones in red are the ones most commonly used. In fact, the constraint-based one at the top, those of you who do any flux balance analysis, it's almost entirely now SPML-based. And there's an extension, uh, the FBA extension, which uh, is geared to adding extra information necessary for the constraint-based models. The other one is visualization, which is a growing standard. Um, there's an extension which lets you describe the actual visual representation of the net of the map. Okay, so um, that's coming along. And then there's some the ones in blue are not so used, but there's a distribution and uncertainty package to add that kind of information to your model. Uh, you can represent qualitative or logical models, and there's growing interest in uh, what are called rule-based models. Some of the others haven't gained much traction, like the spatial, because it's actually quite complex. Dynamical model composition didn't, I think, was the wrong. It's basically for modeling development, but I think I don't think it's the right place to put it. Um, array support, it was just too difficult to express it in XML. It's not a good vehicle for that, and so on. But some of these were uh, successful. Some of them are still not, not used so much. So it's quite a, quite a large ecosystem now. Um, the other thing that... Uh, helped its success for software support. Right at the beginning, we developed libraries, software libraries, to help developers integrate SPML into their tools. And I think this was also a major uh, help to, to people to get it out into the environment, into the community. So you can now, there's a major library called libSPML, um, and it has bindings to uh, C, C++, C Sharp, Julia, Python, etc. And we just released a JavaScript uh, version ourselves. Um, those of you, I don't know if any software geeks in the uh, in the audience, but um, what we did to generate the JavaScript version, what we used this tool called Inscripten. This is a very really magical tool. It'll take any C++ code base, and it basically converts it into what's called WebAssembly. Now, WebAssembly is basically the machine code that runs inside your browser. And once you have that, then you just create a JavaScript wrapper around it, and you have whatever tool it was, whatever software you have, you have it running in, in your browser. And just to give you an example, we put this thing together. This is um, make your own SPML models. Right? This, this is now running entirely in the browser, and it's being pulled off GitHub. So all the JavaScript has been pulled off GitHub page, which is really convenient. We don't have to maintain a server. It's so like you can access this anywhere in the world on any device. Um, and it's pulled down the JavaScript libraries that support the SPML. We have this special format called SPML, uh, called antimony on the left, which is a human readable form for it. And if I, you know, if I click the button, I get the SPML. As you can see, the SPML is not a pretty thing to, to look at, so you don't tend to want to do, look at that. Um, I think this is a really cute technology, being able to take legacy software and convert it to JavaScript and have it running on the browser. I, and we're going to be doing this a lot more. So anyway, so this is an easy place where you can type your model. So this, I don't know if you can see this, the font is too small, but uh, you can probably see there's a two reactions here. S1 goes to S2 plus S3 and S2 goes to S3. There's two simple rate laws there. There's some initialization and, and that's it. And then, uh, so if you if you can either go both ways, you can either have you have an SPML model and you want to look at what it looks like, uh, or you you have already written a model in this form and you want to convert it to SPML, you can do it that way. Um, and I guess I can show you an example, a much bigger example. Where is it? Oh, it's down here. Um, this uh, is one of our EGF models. It's it's we're trying to produce a. Um, uh, what's the word? Um, a baseline model for the EGF pathway 
for which people can reuse bits of it and build on it. So this is this um, part of this, and you can see here, you, if you look, if these are all the species, and then these are all the reactions in the EGF pathway. Not differential equations, these are specifically the, the chemical reactions that occur in the EGF pathway. And so these are the reactions here, and then we have some, uh, um, some more. Uh, there's actually two compartments here as well. There's the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And then we have some rules that go with it, and then we have some initialization uh, and so on. And then you can just click the, the green button, and it'll run, it'll, then it'll run the simulation. This now can be exported as SPML, and anybody else can take that and use it in their favorite tool, okay, like Copasi, vCell, or whatever you want to use. So anyway, that's what it, that's what it looks like, all right? And um, it's much easier to do this than try to write the differential equations yourself because if you want to update the model, it becomes pretty tedious then to update the differential equations. Okay. So here I can just update the reaction, or take a take a reaction away, add a reaction, change the rate law, regenerate the model. It's very very quick, and, uh, productive environment. Um, okay. So let's go back to let's go back to this. Oops, if I go back to it, there we go. And let's go full screen. See, are we on full screen? Yeah, we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I just ran was Spider, and I think I spotted somebody on their laptop using Spider. I think earlier in the week. Um, I, it's quite a decent environment for running py Python in general, if you like that. Okay. Um, so this is basically a summary um, of basically the ecosystem now, the, the SPML ecosystem. It's much bigger than it was. There's all sorts of things associated with it. The other thing that's happened is new standards have arisen. Uh, have I got, yeah, okay, there's things like, I'm gonna mention these in shortly, but CellML, NeuroML, SPOL, SETML, um, that's just the core standards. Then there's associated standards like Combine Archive, a uh, bunch of uh, ontologies. For example, the simulation algorithm, you want to specify what algorithm did you use to run the model, um, and things like that. And there have been other putative standards, some successful, some, some not. I mean, I should add, you know, I mean, the use of standards is a... Uh, I mean, I came into this talk as thinking, how do I pitch this talk? Because... Uh, I don't want to sound, you know, like I'm preaching. I mean, everybody's free to do whatever they want, but you have to, I have to instead convince you that if you use these standards, there are benefits to you. Um, because if you already have a workflow in place that works for you, you're not going to change, right? Unless the advantages are really significant. So I'm going to go through some of the advantages uh, that standards can give you and... I think maybe for small models, you know, we saw yesterday a four-state model. I don't think it's so important, right? Those are easily manageable and the size they are. But if you're starting dealing with large models, especially whole genome models, you've got to be more systematic. Uh, there's just too many moving parts, right, to just keep writing ODEs or whatever mathematical framework it is by hand. And plus, you want to start associating with the model other things like your data sources, your uncertainties. You need basically a full record, an audit trail of what you did with the model. And I think, you know, with the interest now in, in we heard about this, uh, the digital twin, I think it's going to be more imperative that modeling becomes more systematic and becomes more like the modeling that occurs in other engineering disciplines. Okay. So it can't be a cottage industry. For these really important models, you, you can't... You have to be a lot more systematic, I think. So, uh, what about the use of SPML? Um, so, a couple of surveys have been done. The last one's in 2021 in molecular systems biology. Pretty much half of all pub models now published in systems biology are in SPML. I think it's much more than half, but at least half anyway. Pretty much all genome scale models are now in SPML. Uh, it's the only sensible way to do it. Uh, and there are two big databases, Big and Seed. And there's a now big, a very big one in Europe that just, I can't remember the name, name of it. I think it's maybe from Innsbruck. I I'm not, can't, can't quite remember. But it's got about 7,500 genome scale models in it. And as I said, the, the minute there was a standard, people started thinking, yes, I can collect Hoover models together and collect them into a repository. Right. And so we had Biomodels was born, and so Biomodels has over a thousand curated models and 
a couple other thousand non-curated models available to it. Um, and it has some heavy usage now. So, And this is out of, uh, this is the EBI. This is the European Bioinformatics Institute. This would be difficult to pull off in the US because we don't have centralized funding like you do here in Europe, you know, where resources are centrally funded. It's all grant-based. So people don't like to run the risk of supporting long-term resources just on grants. It's, it's just too stressful. Uh, so the, so the, the major model database is here in Europe, okay, in biomodels. Right. Now the DOE, BIG and SEED are large, well SEED is largely supported by the Department of Energy and BIG I think is supported by funding from Luxembourg of all places, even though it's in the US. So little old Luxembourg comes to the rescue. Um, there are other formats as well. I mentioned Salamel. I think Salamel may be more familiar to you here in this group. Um, it has a very different philosophy. It actually codifies the model itself, the mathematical model. So it's pretty much fixed. Uh, so if you have a Salamel model, first thing that's, that's disappeared is the network structure. There is no network. It's been subsumed into the math. And you can't reverse engineer it back out. So it's sort of fixed. So um, when we first thought about this, we looked at Salamel and we realized we didn't want to go in that direction. The other one is NeuroML, which is used to support um, uh, neurophysiolo uh, neurophysiological systems. And then SBOL, which is one I started some years ago, is in the synthetic biology domain. It's basically for describing synthetic biology designs. So the idea is you can, you, know, you can design something on your computer and send it off to a foundry. They'll make the DNA for you. You send it back. You put it, you, know, you try it out. So it's basically in a, it's a way of formalizing the design of some, you know, new synthetic uh, biology uh, constructs. OK, so that's basically the background, sort of historical background, where I came from, the SPML, and a couple of other standards. Uh, what I want to talk about now is something about repeatability and reproducibility. So I, I lead a center, NIH Center, uh, UW, and University of Connecticut, and a couple of other places on reproducibility. Um, I don't have to probably give you the history lesson here, but oh well, I've got this funny slide for you. Um, Ten years ago, there was a great fuss made about the inability to reproduce experimental, published experimental work, all right, uh, mainly in the cancer domain. And it turned out that uh, reproducibility in, uh, in computational science was perhaps worse, ironically. Um, and so there was a lot of, there have been a lot of publications on reproducibility and what to do about it and what the problem is. And it turns out, you know, we've been doing science now for what, two and a half thousand years. Um, the definitions of what is what it means to be re reproducible is seems still to be uh, ill-defined, or at least different domains of different interpretations for what they mean by reproducibility. Okay, even though it's it's the foundation of the scientific method. All right. Um, there's a very nice paper uh, on the preprint paper. I don't think it was ever formally published, but it's a great little paper, uh, actually it's not that little, it's quite long, on the terminologies. It was a study of terminologies across the scientific domains and beyond. And out of this then came a National Academy's report actually on the whole reproducibility area. Um, so we have um, some particular definition that we use to try to keep it simple. Uh, we basically have two extreme scenarios. And this is now for computational modeling, okay? Number one is you've written a model, uh, you ran it, you know, Tuesday afternoon, you got a result, you come in the next day, Wednesday afternoon, you run it again, you get the same result. Wow, fantastic. Uh, you manage to repeat your simulation. Um, not, a, not a great statement, perhaps, but that is the initial, that's the, the lowest possible uh, level of reproducibility, that you can actually reproduce it on your own machine. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's a crazy idea. Of course, if I run it again, it'll, it'll give you the same result. Uh, it turns out that one of the COVID models, the Imperial, Imperial College COVID model, had a strange effect where if you run it again, it gave you a slightly different result. I don't quite understand what was going on there. It wasn't a stochastic model. It was something else, which I'm not quite sure what it was. Um, the other uh, uh, case is if you run it, let's say you ran your model on Windows and you move it to Linux and you run it again, there's no guarantee it'll, it'll work. And in fact, there are cases where uh, you run a computational experiment on Windows, you run it on Linux, you get a different result. 
uh, and that's because of different the different ways in which Linux handles file systems, it turned out to be. Now, the other uh, extreme is you read the paper and you rebuild the model from scratch, everything. You write the software, you look at the literature, you put the whole thing together with guidance from the paper, you use your own algorithms, you run that, you get the same result. Now, that's a much, much stronger statement, okay? And um, so this is, these are the sort of two extremes. Now, number two, of course, in some cases, in some areas of science, you can't do it. You can't do a full reproducibility experiment. For example, if you're looking for the Higgs boson, you're not going to make a new CERN somewhere else. All right? Uh, so there are practical limitations. Um, but at least in, the comp in, our, in our field, we can actually try to repeat some, some aspects of somebody's published model. So those are the two extremes, OK? Oh, uh, yeah, talking about reproducibility is one of my pet topics is ancient Greek manuscripts. And um, these are two Euclid elements. So, you know, the foundation of geometry, deductive, the entire deductive uh, setup for, for 2D and 3D geometry and, and basic number theory. These are two manuscripts from about the 9th century. Uh, one is Vatican 190. That's a very early version of Euclid. And the other one is a de Orville copy from 888 Constantinople, which was a later version of, so this is pre-4th century, this is after 4th century. What's very really nice about Euclid, in fact, pretty much all the Greek mathematical texts, it's all re repeatable today. Two, two and a half, two thousand years later, amazing. There are models published last year I can't reproduce. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, you know, it makes you, makes you wonder, okay. Yeah, in fact, there are, there are some really large metabolic kinetic models that have been published in recent years that are totally non-reproducible. And I think it's a huge waste of resources. But anyway. So, yeah, this sort of depicts the extremes. So you have, you know, minimal expectation of repeatability, okay? Uh, and in this case, what you would do in a publication, you would provide the executable code, the data, everything that the person needs. You perhaps mention the operating system as well, Windows 10, 11, Linux, Mac, whatever. And you, you, you pretty much give everything to the, to the reader, and they will download the code, run it, and they get the, hopefully they get the same result, right? That's, that's one extreme. Um, by the way, even that, is, I'll show you something in a minute, that even that is not really achieved much either. So at the other extreme, because the, the, we recreate the study from scratch, you know, so, and then you have bits in between. Um, and there's sort of three aspects that you can try to reproduce in a model. Let's say you had a, you read a published model and you want to, you're suspicious that something is not quite right with it. Well, there are three areas that you can recreate yourself. You can either recreate the model, you can recollect the data somehow, or you can completely use a completely different algorithm, right? And the hope is that uh, you get the same result. Now, the thing about SPML is it lets you retarget the model and the algorithms, at least the algorithms, right? So with SPML, I can load it into a different simulator with a different algorithm and run it again. It's very easy, right? So it's very easy to do the bottom one. The top one, um, you're not creating the model from scratch, but you're using a different platform that has to interpret the biological description of the model and produce the same executable, All right? So I guess in some sense, you're testing the software for the top one, and the bottom one, you're testing the algorithms. Now, the data, of course, you have to, uh, there's, there's no shortcut there. You have to collect it yourself. So these are the sort of three areas that you can target. If you're trying to uh, show that a, a study is not an artifact, but is actually some real, real signal. So this is something I wanted to show you. So I'm saying, you know, this is the minimum. Well, there is there is something below the minimum, right over here somewhere under the curtains, uh, which is the pub, the uh, the author supplies nothing. And there's this study on, um, because COVID, you know, flavor of the month, so to speak, uh, there's uh, lots of COVID publications, especially in the preprint service, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, this group did a study on the reproducibility of the models in COVID-19 preprints. It just got published properly, well, actually, last year it got published formally. Basically, they discovered, they went through four archives, uh, you know, Biomed, SOC, and R, and discovered 
most quarter, at least a quarter of the papers, neither had data nor code. So this is below the bare minimum, okay? So none of this work could even be repeated, let alone. I guess you could reproduce it if you tried, I suppose. You'd have to read the paper and build the whole thing yourself. But uh, so that, you know, there are cases where it's much worse than the bare minimum. Um, and I'm going back to this study from the EBI group uh, in Cambridge. Um, they wrote a paper, this 2021. The other thing they were interested in was uh, how reproducible are papers, is, you know, is work, and, or repeatable, I suppose I should say. I have anecdotal dev evidence from 2000s. Uh, I've talked to both the biomodels group and the New Zealand group, and they claim uh, between 97 and 100% of published models could not be reproduced. I even repeated. Right, it's a huge proportion. Uh, now, 10 years, 10, 15 years later, it's down to about 50%. So it's much, much better. Right? So if you go to a publication today, you've got a 50-50 chance that you'll be able to re redo their study. Okay? So things are much better. And this is pretty much down to uh, SPML. Um, now, you may be wondering, well, what, what, you know, this other 50%, what's the problem? Well, the problem is either the, the model is just missing or very mundane issues. Uh, so I got a selection here, but there are hundreds and hundreds of these. So number one, incomplete parameters. They didn't have all the parameters. Uh, number two, incomplete model definition. Number three, no parameter values at all. And number four is interesting. This is a very famous model from Caltech, NF kappa B, cannot be reproduced. Uh, here's a funny one, irony of ironies. Lessons learned from quantitative dynamic modeling in systems biology, analysis procedure, analysis procedure not described. Uh, parameters incorrectly annotated, another one that's not completely irrepro irreproducible. And this one, I'm going to, I'll have a sp specific slide on this one. Uh, this was the whole genome mycoplasma model Jonathan Carr, Marcus Cover did some years ago, got published in Cell. Uh, turns out it can't be reproduced either. But I'll come back to that, why that's the case. Uh, so, really simple problems, right? Nothing. Uh, you know, missing data, incorrect units, etc. Model only supplied as a binary. That's very useful. Um, simulation environment no longer available, right? And the other thing, because in the 2000s, right, those of us who remember, it was, it was trendy to have your own personal website uh, where you'd stuff all your research material. Five years later, your website disappeared because you could no longer have the time to maintain it and everything you had went with it. So, uh, you know, so don't do that, okay? Um, and here's a specific example. This was sent to me by somebody from a company. They were really mad because it took them a week to get this to work. It's a physiological model of a, a neuron published in 2011. There's a couple of no-nos in this paper. Uh, if you go through this, they don't provide the code or anything. If you, if you try to recreate this model, it won't work. And it took him a week to figure out what the problem was. And it focuses on the radius of the neuron. It turns out that is not the radius, but the diameter. So the volume was completely wrong. So all the concentrations are wrong. And so the simulation just wouldn't work. That was the really, that was the simple problem. And you know, if the person is being paid, you know, $100, $150 an hour, and it took a week, that's an expensive mistake. So uh, the other problem was they never included the uh, end, end plates of the neuron in the area calculation either. So the other thing uh, you, you probably can't see, but the model is actually embedded in the text. If you look on the top left-hand corner, the, and down that column actually, that's where all the differential equations are. So don't recommend doing that. In fact, I don't even recommend uh, writing out the ODEs at the end of the paper in an appendix because invariably there are transcribed errors, almost always. Um, so it's best to have it in, in raw code or SPML, uh, some form like that. 
Okay. Uh, okay, the question then comes back to, you know, why does it really matter? You know, we're making a lot of fuss for nothing. Science hasn't collapsed. You know, we're still moving forward. Is there a problem? There is a problem, I think, for um, critically important models for society, like COVID models, any models that you use in the clinic, uh, climate change models, of course. Uh, those are, I think, is really critical, where policy decisions are based on the results of those models. You need to, some, you need to have some trust in that model. And if it's not even reproducible, then, you know, it's a bit suspicious, right? But what about our academic models, right? Well, you do, there's a loss of intellectual capital, and it really upsets me that these big kinetic models that have been published recently, you can't get them to work. Uh, it's a huge waste of tax, tax money. It's a lack of professionalism in some respects. It's a poor application of the scientific method, of course. And I think the biggest problem, and we talked about this at dinner, I think, is a loss, loss of trust by the general public, which is probably the worst outcome. Um, and in America, as you probably know, we're all crazy over there. Um, climate change, evolution, vaccination, <laughs> everybody is a skeptic, okay, for no good reason. And so there's a lack of trust in the public, and we should try to make sure that the work we do is trustworthy. Okay. Um, why does it happen? Uh, it's a very simple, easy explanation. It's because the reward system is skewed. Right? There's, there's, no, there's no reward for, for following the scientific method. Um, so if you've ever been you know, in a promotion situation or wanting a salary increase, what do they look at? They look at how many papers you published, how many grants you got, uh, things like that. Uh, and they're trying to, at least at our university, they're trying to move to different metrics. Um, but the, these pressures are very strong. And so all, and you know, our bandwidth is limited. So all our focus is on maximizing paper and grant output. The fact that the model is not reproducible, yes, it would be nice, but it doesn't give me promotion. Okay, so, so the the reward system is is not good. Okay. Um, so, what have I got here? So, it's unlikely we will change the university system. If you want to change this, it's the the university is not. They're not going to change. It's too built. Too. It's too ingrained. The other uh, place we can do something is at the reviewer stage. But again, uh, maybe expectations are not there, time constraints. Uh, reviewers are not as, as rigorous either. Okay. So there's also a general lack of interest from journals. Um, and it's the simple reason is nobody wants to be first. Because if you're first in, in requesting reproducible publications, it means you may put off authors. They may then publish in a different journal where it's easier to get the paper in. Right? So, and because of the open access model, there's a lot of money involved, and so you want to try to minimize any restrictions to publication. And requiring reproducibility is one such restriction. And I I've, know I've this is the case. I've got this from a couple of major journals. They've said this is why they don't want to move forward with this because they're scared of frightening off authors. Uh, now, the one journal that has, is actually doing something about is Ploscom Bio, and we did a pilot with them a year or two back. Um, basically, what we do is we, we act as the fourth reviewer. Right? So there's normally three reviewers, right, maybe? We act as a fourth. And what we do is we just check that the, all the data is there, the model is there. And if, it's, if it doesn't require a supercomputer, we will run it on our desktop to make sure it runs OK. And then we send a report back. Okay, that, that's it. takes takes less than a week. Right? It's a f free service as well. So, uh, so this is part of the pilot. Basically, fifty percent of the models turned out to be reproducible. I mean, we only went through how many? Uh, f Forty-four, fifty models. Uh, but half of them are reproducible. Okay, so. What's interesting, if you do ask authors to you know, revisit their model to make it re reproducible, the bulk are more than happy to comply. So it's not a case of they don't want to, it's just a time constraint, right? Or it's a priority uh, issue. Um, but if you ask them, they'll not, they have no problem 
fixing whatever the problem was. And usually the, the problems are really simple, like missing code, missing documentation, errors in the code, etc. cetera. Okay? And they're usually easy things to fix. So. Uh, okay, yeah, the solutions. Um, the university reward system is unlikely to change. Um, it'll be a major cultural shift, which I can't see happening, especially in the US, I don't see it happening. The most effective way is, I think the most, the easiest place to have an effect is at the review stage. And that means the, you, the audience, especially the young folk who are coming into this field and maybe starting to review papers, you can make a difference, okay? Uh, if a paper doesn't have, at minimum, right, you could check, is the code there, is the data there, is the documentation there? If it isn't, you can actually point that out in, the, in your review and say, revision, minor revision, please supply code, data, documentation, okay? So it, it's a relatively easy solution. Um, okay, so so let's say you know we 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 we've solved this now. People are, want to publish reproducible work. What what options do they have? And there's a couple here. One is what's called containerization, which is using Docker images. And I noticed there was a poster that used Docker images. These are basically uh, virtual machines. They contain everything you need to do whatever it is you want to do. So that's one way. Another one is workflows. Uh, you can publish raw source code, right? Or you can use a, some kind of model definition language like SPML. There are issues with all of these. Containerization is too, compli too complicated for most researchers. It requires too much expertise. Workflows turns out are too fragile. I'll go into this in a bit more detail. Uh, raw, source code, raw source code does work. Um, but the downside is it's the, it's not, the models are not reusable. It's not easy for somebody to take that model, unless it's really small, to reuse it in another model. All right, let's say, you know, somebody publishes a model in MATLAB, but they're a Python user. They have to now convert that model into Python. Not only that, it may be a set of differential equations, and they need to merge that with another model, or they only need part of the model. It will take a lot of work to disassemble and reassemble the model. So. Um, model definition languages also work, but what is in it for you? Okay, so that's the other issue. Yes, it works, but uh, is there enough of an incentive for you to use that? Um, so just briefly, some, some of these examples. So this is uh, Titus Brown from Michigan. He was one of the first, he published this really nice preprint showing exactly, this is a genomic study, showing how you could use containerization to describe an entire uh, study, okay? Um, so he had tutorials, he had a Git repository, this is before the, the uh, popularity of GitHub. Um, he had instructions for running the analyses, he had HTML pages with IPython and now it's Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, he had zip files containing all the data for the pipeline and so on. And the whole thing was run in a virtual machine. Now for him it worked, right? But if you're not tech savvy, this may not be the way to, that you want to do it. The other one is uh, using a workflow. So those, these are very popular amongst the bioinformatics community where you have a pipeline of you know, analyses you need to do, one after the other. And you run these repeatedly, uh, very useful. And there are a couple of platforms like Galaxy, Taverna, and Pegasus that support pipelines. The issue, uh, the main issue is they're very fragile. They, they break very easily because they rely on calling out out of the program to some remote resource or some local resource which may or may not be there. And so there's actually an entire site called myexperiments.org, which was a repository for workflows. The bulk of them don't work anymore. Uh, and there's actually a, a, a phrase for this phenomenon called workflow decay. So for long-term archival purposes, workflows are not probably for day-to-day -day operations, they, they're great, okay? In a lab, right? Um, but for long-term, say 10 years, NSF, National Science Foundation, had a, at one point a 10-year expectation for, for how long data should, should survive and be accessible. Uh, this won't last 10 years, it'll probably last two years, and then it's broken. Uh, what about a programming language? Yes, you can do that, and for so, small models, it's fine, I think. But for big models, it's, it's a problem. So this is an example of the mycoplasma model 
This is one of the one of the first. It wasn't the first. The first was back in the late 60s, I think. Um, but this is one of the recent first whole cell models. The idea is you try to model an entire cell. Very interesting, challenging idea. Okay. Um, so what they did, they built a model of mycoplasma. It was basically in MATLAB. It was almost 150,000 lines of MATLAB and a couple of thousand lines of Perl. Uh, the simulation and model data were stored in binary mat files, dot mat files. Um, and so in 2015 in Germany, they, there was a workshop to try to attempt to reproduce the model, but it was unsuccessful. And there's a, there's a paper written about all the issues they had. One issue was, for example, they had to reverse engineer the MATLAB code to recover the model. Okay? And one problem was, there, were, there was comments in the code, but the comments was out of date with the code itself. So the code had been modified, but the comments hadn't been updated. So it was very difficult to try to reverse engineer back the original model. So this model is sort of sitting isolated and nobody can reproduce it. So um, Now Jonathan, uh, he joined the center, our reproducibility center, and I think he knows now this is probably not the way to do it. Um, so. Uh, Anyway, this is an interesting experiment, okay? So for large models, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, what about a modeling standard? Okay, of course I'm going, to, I'm going to be biased here and tell you all the wonderful things that a modeling standard can do. Um, so first thing is, you know, it allows models to be exchanged between different tools. And as I said, academic software has a very short shelf life, right? Comes and goes. The, 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 the community's littered with thousands of software packages that no longer work. Uh, so if you have some kind of independent format, you can just move your model from, you know, keep going with the latest and greatest software package. Um, the other thing, it makes the models much, much more uh, repeatable and partly reproducible. It's so much, so much easier to get a model working once it's in SPML. You just load it up, run it. There's a really nice model, uh, what date was it? What, five years ago? A uh, large kinetic model of E. coli, uh, Pedro Mendes is one of the authors. You download that model, it runs. Within 30 seconds, you get a result. I mean, it, uh, that is such a nice feeling when you can download such a complex model and it just works. Okay, no fussing, nothing. And because it's in SPML, all the reaction steps are there. You can see exactly what's in the model. Right, so, and you can just change it then as well. Um, so I'm going to come back to this a little bit, uh, but SPML lets you annotate the model, right? So if you're, so you, that means you can identify all the components of the model unambiguously, so it helps you start to understand the model. Um, the other big thing for me is, as well, it's easy to reuse models or parts of the model. Once it's in these formats, you can just pull pieces out, all right? So for example, we, we've taken the entire biomodels database and pulled out every rate law for every model. And because they're all annotated as well, we know exactly what the enzyme is, what the metabolites are. So we have this local database of every rate law that's ever been used in biomodels, searchable, okay? So if you search for phosphofructokinase, you'll find about six rate laws. So you can just look at them and pick which one you want to use. So it's like a component database. So. Okay, if that does not convince you, this one definitely will. Uh, it finally got published. It was in review for quite a while. Um, came out in 2023, German group. Um, they actually looked at uh, what's, what, what is, there a, is there a citation benefit? Citations, right? They, they matter, right? That's, that's, that's going to get you. There's a big fat carrot here with citations written on it. It turns out that uh, if you write your model in something like SPML, it's significantly more citable than if it isn't. The reason is simple, is because you can actually reuse those models. All right, so if you've got a choice of two models, you know, one in, uh, written in raw C++ and then written in SPML, you've got to go for the SPML one straight away. All right, it's just, just too much fuss to try to extract the model out of the C++. So, uh, I think this is, you know, in, in terms of career enhancement, this is, this is the one, okay? So, 
this is good. This is, we were often wondered whether there was any advantage uh, in, in terms of, you know, citation and impact if you published a model in something like SPML. It turns out there was. Uh, oops, wrong way. Okay. Um, just to show you, there are other uh, examples like this which use a similar thing. So those of you who use LaTeX and Tech, that's been around since the early 80s. I've still got LaTeX files from the mid 80s that I can still run through LaTeX and get beautiful PDFs. You try that with Word, it won't work. The way it works is, and the way SPML works is, you basically specify, a, you, speci you have a specification for what the, the standard is, and then people write to that specification. So in this case, there's a specification for the syntax and the output files. There's a, what's called a DVI file, which is a, a device independent file. That is all specified, and all you have to do is write to that, and you'll be able to, you, you'll be able to you know, compile documents from the 80s. And so I'm sure a lot of you use LaTeX here. I think there's one or two posters I think were done in LaTeX. I can spot the fonts. So um, there's an example. Another one, perhaps more fun, is uh, computer emulators. Uh, those of you who grew up in the 80s, well, I guess a lot of you didn't, but anyway, those of you who did, uh, used these early computers. They had lots of fun games on them. You can't get the computers anymore. Maybe for nostalgia reasons, you'd like to run those terrible games again. Uh, yes, you can. You can run. You can get emulators. You, there's pretty much an emulator from almost every computer there ever was, all the way back to the 1959 IBM 7790. Um, and the reason this works is because they write to a specification, and then you can uh, reproduce all this old technology. So this is a funny one. This is a. It's an emulator within an emulator. Okay, so you it's turtles all the way down, so to speak. Okay. Okay, so if you do, what else can you do? I mean, if you have your model in SPML, what else can you do? I mean, there's a lot of other information you could put with the model. For example, the simulation setup, the parameter sets, any diagrams, raw data, PDF do documents, any other metadata you want to go with it. And so the community came up with this archive, this Omex archive, especially a zip file, um, that basically has a manifest inside it and then has everything, all the necessary information. So BioModels is moving towards this archive format. Uh, in our, our own resource, we're moving towards the, this format. It's a nice way of packaging things. Uh, and it's not an unusual way to do things. If, you, if those of you who use Word, if you take the, the DOCX extension and change it to zip, then double click the file, you'll realize that the Word document is a zip file with a manifest. Okay, and it contains all sorts of components that make up the word file. So it's the sort of same, same philosophy. So we're going to try and move the world in this direction. So you, when you download a model, you get the whole thing, everything you need. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about this hardly at all, but there's another standard called SetML, which is a way of describing what experiment did you actually do on the model. This is in a language independent way. So this can be converted to Python, MATLAB, whatever language you want, and then run the model in the way you was originally specified. But I'm not going to say any more about this. Um, now, once you have all this in place, you can also start doing things like this. So this is a, um, so it's part of our center, uh, is what's called, uh, I've called it our reproducibility portal. Uh, this will be live at the end of the month. Um, basically, you can type something in here, say glycolysis, okay, and it'll come up with, there's going to be about 500 to 1,000 published models on this site, and they're all reproducible in the sense you can run the simulations, um, and you can download the files and so on. So I, for some reason, okay, I picked this one. And what it'll give you, it'll give you the title of the paper it came from, an abstract, a link that'll take you directly to the paper, Okay, and then you can actually um, run the simulation as well. This is not a very interesting one. Now, it's still not quite ready yet because you see all these labels are a bit crazy. So, um, so this is a work in progress and there's a whole bunch of things going to go on, this, on the model side. So you'll be able to get at least, uh, at least 500, uh, probably 1,000 models you can search on. Uh, we're going to have a very fluid search up here, author, any key name you want. We try to mimic it on sort of Google 
uh, and so you type whatever you want, and it'll try and find, you know, if you if I in, insulin, right? If I type insulin, uh, it comes up with a whole bunch of uh, insulin models, and you just pick one, and then you'll be able to say add an author name to pin it down to a particular author or whatever. So this is one of uh, this is a. Uh, um, there's two big resources we have in the center. This is one of them, and the other one is, and I'm not sure if I may have it in the next slide. Um, what we got? Yeah, let me see. Uh, yes, so the other major resource we have, so this is a quick, easy thing. You can go in, search for a model, look at the simulation, and then download it and run it on your desktop. Alternatively, you can go to the main site, which is biosimulations.org. This is being revamped at the moment. Uh, what it is essentially is a model, uh, it's a simulation farm. So, oops, sorry. So the idea is that we have a whole, we have about 20 Docker images that uh, encapsulate all the major software simulation platforms. Uh, and so we have a standardized input into using the standards. So lots of different models can come in and then you can choose to run it on whatever platform you want. This is primarily for verification. So if you run a model on, on, a, on a certain platform and you want to run it on another one quickly without having to install anything, you can just ask it to run it on another platform just to confirm you get the same results. Okay? Um, and this is also going to be used, um, the next, one of the next projects is, is to combine these simulation platforms in, to run multi-simulation uh, systems for, very, for uh, models that require different modeling approaches. So you might have one model running EODs, another piece running stochastic, another piece running an agent-based, another piece running a population uh, of humans, okay? So you can combine, knit the whole thing together. So, yeah, so that's so there are basically two two sites. This one, which is the easy to get to, quick, get the model, search, and then this one is a bit more sophisticated, uh, where you can run your model on different different platforms. Uh, okay, so this is I'm I'm got I'm going to go on for another just under ten minutes probably, and then we'll talk a bit. Um, but I briefly mention um, annotation. Sometimes you'll find uh, models, here we go, there's a model up there, okay, um, there's, some, there's a constant here, K, it's called K-on or K-off, and you may want to know more details about that constant, like what actually is it, or you may find that the names of the species, I mean, I can guess it's probably an enzyme complex, product, substrate, and enzyme, but it could be X1, X2, X3, X4, and you have no idea what they are. Uh, you can annotate your model with extra metadata to tell you exactly what these things are. And there's a way of annotating, we, we heard about ontologies yesterday, there's a way of adding a whole range of ontologies to your model. This one is the systems biology ontology, and if I go to, um, let's go to the website uh, here, and it was uh, SBO35, uh, I think. If I type that in there, it tells me this is a, uh, uh, a mass action rate law for a third order irreversible reaction with three reactions with three reactants. So I get a very specific um, statement of what a thing is. Okay, so it's no longer ambiguous. Okay, this is also hosted out of EBI as well. So uh, we rely a lot on uh, European Bioinformatics Institute. Good stuff. Um, so you can do that. Um, you can annotate with, you know, Chevy, Uniprot, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to identify all the various components you have in the model. So this becomes useful, for example, when you want to automate merging of models. So you can identify the common pieces and bring them together. Okay. Uh, so these are some of the, you know, why is it useful to annotate? The trouble with annotation is tedious. Nobody wants to do it, of course. Um, but uh, there are advantages in understanding the model. The minute you have metadata like that, you can start doing searches. Like, I want all models that use a particular michaelis menten equation. All right? You can start comparing models, et cetera, et cetera. It basically adds a semantic, semantic layer onto your models. Um, now, as I said, it's really tedious. 
Is it tedious? Yes, it is. <laughs> and nobody wants to do it. So one of the things we've been doing is developing some tooling to help with this. And this one we're about to release called AMAS. It's specifically for metabolic models, um, but it'll, it'll, it'll automatically annotate your metabolic model with all the proper reaction names, all the proper metabolite names. It builds on previously annotated models such as big and bio models. So it basically infers what the annotation should be based on evidence it gets from uh, other models. So it has a big database uh, telling it what's what and then you can infer. And it'll also give recommendations. If there are multiple possibilities, it'll give you a probability of what's the most likely rec uh, annotation. Uh, and then you can ask it, yes, go run with that, and it'll annotate it with that. So I'm hoping that things like this will accelerate the annotation of models, because otherwise it's just too... I mean, I have tried chat GPT. Yes, I have. Um, it tries very hard, um, but it creates a mess. You know, you'd, you can ask it to give you a model of glycolysis, and it'll give you a model of gly glycolysis. You can ask it for an SPML, it'll give it to you an SPML. You can ask for it for even in our readable format, it'll give you in that form. You ask it to annotate, it has a go, and it creates a bit of a mess. So, not quite there yet. But I can imagine, you know, five, ten years, is probably all AI driven. This is the kind of thing you want AI driven, right? Because it's just too tedious to do. Okay. The other thing we have, um, this is not quite ready yet, but it's a uh, Visual Studio Code extension to help you annotate models as well. Um, let you browse the bio models directly. It has syntax highlighting. You can hover over things to figure out what things are. It has error detection on the models. It will automatically create rate laws for you and so on. Uh, this is not quite ready yet. Um, installing Visual Studio Code extensions is not easy. Writing the code was easy, but getting the installation to work, that has become that was difficult. Okay, so last five minutes, because this is a pretty new area, and I don't have too much to show, but it's part, to me one of the most exciting next, next stages. So we're undergoing uh, a renewal of the center this summer. We're going to be reviewed uh, by the NIH, and our big push is model credibility. I think this is the next natural next stage. Your model's reproducible, but do I believe it? Okay, so this is inspired by two things. One, a group of colleagues uh, of mine, they published the, this top 10 rules for credible models, all right? So you can go through these points and you, know, you can tick them off. And if, the more ticks you get, the more credible your model, okay? Uh, the last one they had, keep me happy was, does it conform to standards? Um, so, and they wrote a very really nice paper on this whole idea, model credibility, you know, you got things like version control, documentation, etc. Now, the other thing that inspired me was, you know, the whole COVID thing at the beginning, although it was blown out of proportion in the end, but there was a lot of fuss at the beginning over the models that were being used to predict uh, the pandemic, uh, the Imperial model and the UW model in particular. The UW model was used by the US largely and the Imperial model was used by the uh, the UK government. I mean, in hindsight, they actually did reasonable predictions, but at the time, there was a lot of criticism uh, at how the models had been built, how they were put together and so on. And, you know, people like Microsoft, Microsoft flew in and said, we will fix your code. And they didn't in the end. Um, but I, this also made me think, you know, maybe there's, there's a case here for moving more, more into the idea of cre model credibility, okay? Because trillions of dollars in decision making are made based on these models. You need some way to assess, do I believe, do I believe this model or this model? Which model should have, you know? Be nice if a policymaker gets one number Say between zero and one, one is yes, use it. Zero is don't go near it, okay? So um, now we have these 10 rules, all right, just to start. And then in fact, there are now a bunch of papers that describe these kinds of things. But and NASA does a lot of this. This also came out of NASA. In fact, one of the guys who wrote this, the 10 credibility, credibility rules here is a NASA guy. NASA, after the Challenger incident, um, the one where the, the foam hit the wing, 
they had to rethink how they used modeling because the model they used to to assess the risk of foam coming off the shuttle and hitting the wing uh, was based on a model that was out of scope and it didn't actually apply and so they got the predictions all wrong and so when it happened of course the wing was damaged and then it was catastrophic end to that. So NASA completely changed the way it did things after that, in term, especially in terms of credibility. And so this partly has come out of, the, out of NASA, the NASA work as well. Now, one problem with this, though, is manual. So somebody has to go through and check. That's not going to really work. It's not going to really scale well. You really need to automate it. Is there something... I mean, the vision we have is there's a website. You drag your combine archive, drop it onto the browser, a report comes up telling you uh, the various aspects of the model that are lacking or, or good. And in fact, there's also already a precedent for that. Uh, there's a thing called Mimot, which came out of uh, Europe as well, uh, which basically does a credibility check on flux balance models, constraint-based models. It's a really nice tool. And you know, people turn to that when they're deciding what genome scale model to use. They will run it through that first, just to see if there's any red flags. All right, so now that's for static models because flux balance models don't have any kinetics. So the idea is produce a kinetic sort of variant on that, which does lots more checks on dynamics and, and, and so on. So there's a couple of papers we recently wrote to try to position ourselves in this area. And one of the things is to bring to bear a lot of software development practices into this area. I mean, one of the things we don't do enough, I think, in modeling, which the software people do a lot of, is testing. Right? You probably all come across the phrase unit testing. They have a vast range of tests that they build up. It's mainly for regression testing. So if you make a modification, you can rerun the test to make sure you haven't broken it. Right? We don't do that in general in modeling, and maybe it's something we should start thinking about. So the idea is, uh, if you have a combine archive with all the information in there, you can look at various things about the model to assess its credibility. Are there model tests? If they are, run them, do they pass? Unit tests, systems tests. This is related to model validation, okay, and verification. Your data sources, do you identify your data sources? Uh, have you identified any uncertainty in your data sources? Have you done anything to that data, like manipulated in some way, and how did you do that? Um, your model sources, what were the assumptions you used? Again, is there any uncertainty in your models? The other big thing is, are there any just mistakes you made in the, rate, in, in the model itself? Easy to do, especially for big models, and you just don't notice, okay? So you put a KM where you should have put a, a KI, just by mistake, you just didn't notice. Simple checks like that. So this is the kind of breakdown we're looking towards. Um, so we've got a series of static tests and a series of dynamic tests. The model verification can be handled by our biosimulation resource because you just point to different simulators to check that you're getting verifying the same results. But other things uh, we have to build out, like uh, there's simple things like balance checks, numerical checks. Um, and specific um, dynamics, but especially validation, of course, is the key one. But there are also a series of um, static check tests. Do you violate mass conservation? Are your physical processes plausible? Uh, in, in metabolic networks, do you violate thermodynamic constraints? Uh, do you have you mistype your math? Uh, and so on. Um, unit consistency, etc. And it'd be nice if we could have some machine-generated documentation, basically a sort of report of your entire model. So this is the kind of thing we're working towards. We have a simple thing at the moment, uh, which we're playing around with, um, which is uh, this thing. So this little tool, you can load in an SPML model, and it'll run through checking for errors in your rate laws. Okay? So it's, it's got a various tests you can look for. It uh, looks for anything that looks a bit suspicious, like typos and so on. It looks for things that are blatantly wrong and so on. For, your, for the tech nerds in this audience, this is an interesting implementation as well. Uh, this is also coming off a GitHub page, but you won't believe what's running in the browser, uh, Python. So it's not JavaScript, it's Python running in the browser. 
And so in the last year or so, the technology has advanced sufficiently you can now run Python inside your browser. So that means we can write Python packages that serve two purposes for the desktop and for the browser, which is really nice for us. So we don't have to write JavaScript and Python. We can just write one. So we basically ended up with, we, 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 we can stay with the C++ Python toolkit. We now just have, we can now run both of them in the browser effectively. So, so anyway, this is a little uh, tool we're putting together. And we, we're hoping to put together a whole set of tools like this uh, that do various checks on your model and then a centralized place where you can just run them all at once and it'll give you a report, basically a sanity report to make sure everything is okay. Um, and I think that's about it. Let me just check. Uh, yes, that's about it. So, a lot of people involved in this work. I mean, I'm just one little person. Um, the entire Combine community over the last 20 years has been building up over many, many years. Uh, David Nickerson, you probably know from Peter Hunter's group, but uh, there's a bunch of youngsters in here, both undergrads, graduates, postdocs, who do all the work. There's a couple of senior people, um, Joe Hellerstein in particular, who's a sort of volunteer, but he loves doing this kind of stuff. He's, a, he's part of an East Science Institute at UW, and he's been a great help to us. So, um, and then a couple of PIs, uh, Jan Moraro from the VCell team, John Denari at UW, and then Jonathan Carr. Jonathan Carr, interestingly, left uh, academic science last year and started a startup company, a modeling startup company. So there's a spin-off. We've got one spin-off from this at least. So uh, anyway, and then support from the NIH and then so. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. Now we have time for questions. Yeah. Yep. Anything controversial? <laughs> I want to know where we go wrong. No, I mean, so I, we had our, some discussions and yeah. I've obviously been interested in this and it, I think you did a terrific job presenting the pros and cons remarkably well. Um, my, I, I have a couple like low level questions and then maybe a, a higher level question. At the yeah. low level, yeah. do, do, can you fail a reproducibility check because for example, uh, and this happens to us all the time. So we do a lot in MATLAB, which I know is proprietary, but our university has a license to yeah. it and it's straightforward to use. Sure. Part of the way they run it is, you know, as, as you know, MATLAB updates like I think every year. Oh, and yeah. the way they do it at our university, they make it really hard for you to hang on to your prior version. Oh, yeah. So you get the new version. Now we ourselves, I, I, have, I can tell you a bunch of times, we would fail that repeatability check. We try to run our own model. Yeah. In MATLAB, it fails, yeah. and it's and and, it, and 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 all of us have a lot less hair on our head because of all the hair pulling we do, and then we have to figure out a way. Mm -hmm. We sometimes keep a computer just with an older version yeah. of MATLAB running, just so that we can yeah. fix that problem. That's so. Then you say, oh, it's all easy. Just go open source, run everything no. in Python. We've no. been doing that. Python updates its libraries. Yes. Our models don't work. Yes. So how do you address this issue? So yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, NumPy. In Python is one of the biggest culprits. Every time they upgrade that, something breaks at some point. But it's such an essential library, hard to live without. But the two things: one, of course, uh, when you install when you install packages in Python, you can do use pip install. You can specify a version. So we have specific requirements for versions, right? So that's one way to preserve your environment. The other one on our biosimulation site, all the Docker all the Docker containers are versioned with the version of the software that was used. So if the, if the paper specifies a particular version they used, that's specified. And so you run it on that version. Um, that's how we've got around it. But yeah, I mean, you're right, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, this is where containers are useful, of course, and they isolate you. But as I said, technically, it might be a bit too much for a lot of people. Um, and I don't even know how that would work if if you f stayed with MATLAB because oh, of the yeah, fact that no. I don't even I don't know if you can doc Dockerize that. Probably and, not. And the licensing I'm, probably. Uh, and, and the licensing precludes it. That's, so that's a that's a fundamental issue. So now a, uh, a another so let's yeah. say a slightly higher level question. Your your comment about the fact that that there is a massive disincentive to to be reproducible 
and then you're connecting that to citations. Yeah. Well, obviously we have this H index, and the H index is about the longevity of yours, of not just the impact that the paper might have had, like yeah. like Marcus Covert's paper yeah. that you mentioned. Obviously, was very impactful. But yeah. then, if this is an issue where you can't reproduce the model, maybe people don't cite the paper as much for so yeah. long, and so then therefore the H index suffers, and that yeah. presumably would start presumably. being reflected. I mean, the hope is that there may be some long-term effect, but in the short term, it doesn't. Uh, and unfortunately, how horizons, at least in the U.S., are sort of like three years long, which is sort of the grant time. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the long term, it might have an, have an impact. Short term, perhaps not. But so you may want to consider including that in, in, yeah. in some caveat to that to that yeah. slide, because I do think it eventually will will matter. I agree. Yeah. If you, your track record of getting money doesn't care about the H index, no. so that, you know that doesn't that doesn't matter so much. It, um, it was nice to see that uh, if you do use standards, it, it helps um, mainly because it's just easier to get hold of the models, so they're more likely to be used. And then my last question is: at the level of the grant funding agencies, there are things they can do. And the, on the DARPA project that I mentioned yesterday, they have a built-in. Uh, effort that they call IVNV or independent verification and validation, oh, yeah. which it's not. It, it actually is uh, in our particular case more targeted to the uh, to, to the to the to the experimental slash device stuff. That so they literally have an entire other group based uh, within the U.S. Army Institute of Surgical Research that has set up a completely separate animal model in a different animal. Oh, that's nice and. Uh, the team that made the devices that re, you know reprogram yeah. the wounds uh, had to teach them how to use them on their device. They flew out. There's all yeah. kinds of back and forth. Yeah. Um, my team that does all the biomarker analysis, we're precluded from doing any biomarker analysis on those experiments. They have their own funding to run yeah. all their own biomarker analyses. So, and, and they haven't asked us on the computational side only because the project as such doesn't actually have a... It's not like the device, again, as I said, doesn't reach to the model to run a prediction about to do. It, it's all implemented in firmware, so basically they don't have to. But the device itself is completely mm. uh, tested in a completely separate platform. You know, and every benchmark yeah. is reproduced by a separate uh, group. So something That's, to consider. That sounds great. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think we underrate the testing. I mean, I sometimes make this frivolous comparison. You've written some software, ship it. No, you don't. that would be a disaster, right? Um, you test and test and test and test and test, and there's still problems. We don't tend, I don't know how much we do that in modeling, to be honest. And we certainly don't have specific frameworks set up to do this sort of regression testing, where you know, you've modified the model a bit, and then you just hit a, hit a button, and it runs, runs all the tests again to make sure you didn't break, break something. Now, John Tyson did something like that, with his cell cycle models, actually, he had he had a um, what was it called? I can't remember now. But he, Jigsaw, yeah. it did something like that, uh, and he's the only one I know though who's had a sort of formal testing system set up. Um, but it's but as we move, you know, if if models start moving towards the clinic and there's all talk about the digital twins, we're well, going to have to change. So. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, one question about SBML, uh, is it expected to support lower level libraries like MKL or for C or C++, for example, or Eigen? Or um, you, can, you can run, um, I mean, libsbml, the, the support library is written in C, C++, so you can uh, you can, you can load SPML into a C, C++ application. No, we, we do it all the time. Is, is that what you meant? I mean, I could keep the gimmicks of like optimization in terms of uh, allocating uh, variables close to each other, like this stuff you can do. Oh, if you want to do, uh, you want to do analyses on the model, like optimization yes. parameter. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what you have to do is, uh, I mean, if you're going to start from scratch, you take libsbml, use it to load in the SPML model, and then you have to generate your own ODEs from that. 
and then you have to connect that to your model calibration software. Now, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, I would use some of the existing tools. In fact, I think the best model calibration optimization software now is happening on Julia. Uh, we've done some large-scale optimization on Julia because that is the fastest platform you can use. So we had to optimize, calibrate a thousand models. We ran it, we used to run it from Python uh, using Lib Roadrunner, which is our high performance simulator, which is the main bottleneck. But anyway, it would take 35 hours to do a single fit. We had to do a thousand of them. We, 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 we ran it on a cluster, it still took forever. I then suggested switching to Julia. So we switched to the Julia optimizers, but we still use Roadrunner because that turned out to be three times faster than the Julia solvers. But those two together, we got it down to seven hours per calibration. And so it became practical then, even, uh, even on a cluster. So my, my advice is if you're going to do model, model calibration in the SPML world is to uh, either use Julia completely uh, and use something like differential evolution as the, as the optimizer and or combine it with uh, Lib Roadrunner as the, as the, because most of the time is spent solving the ODEs. And you want that to be as fast as you can. So Roadrunner basically compiles the SPML literally down to machine code using LLVM as a back end. And so you get maximum speed and uh, without any fuss either. So then you combine that with the, op the uh, Julia optimizers, you get full, full on. So if you, if you, I can, if you email me, I can, I can point you to my postdoc who did that. Sure, thank you. Yeah, it made it practical. And we don't do enough of that, you know. We, we sort of sing, we still focus on the, the model rather than ensembles of models because our uncertainty really is also in the model itself, not just the parameter values. So, but it, but it's, it's been largely impractical because it's so computationally expensive. Yeah. yeah. Hi, this is Gunnar. Yeah. Um, so, Nice and super important uh, presentation and topic. Um, so, uh, as you know, we talked a little bit al yeah. already. Yeah. My sort of plan is to make my digital twin models uh, in a public version where uh, everybody can contribute with their own sub-model. Ah, right. uh, and yeah. I've sort of been waiting for these type of initiatives to yeah. mature enough to have a, a platform to build yeah. that on. Because yes. you would need to sort of add additional layers uh, to to describe uh, the additional annotations and qualities yes. and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great use case um, to see if this would actually work in practice. You know, there's a, I mean, it does seem to work, but it's not been tried on a large scale, right, like a digital twin. But I've been talked. Somebody got in touch with me in the U.S. They're trying to push the digital twin in the U.S. and they want to they've realized that standards is one of the key elements for mm. doing a digital twin. Because the, the heart of the digital twin, I guess, is being able to, as you suggest, mix and match pieces together. Yeah. And in order to do that, they have to be in standard form so they can be merged. Yeah, and, and one, of the limit, one of the problems is that it will require a variety of different simulation packages yep. which are not compatible with SPML, Correct. all of them. Yeah. So, so you somehow need to go I mean, beyond I guess, that. Yeah, no, you make a good point there. And one of the, my disappointments, I guess, that no other domain has tried to do this. I've been trying to push the multicellular domain. Mm. I think they finally got a grant, actually, to do it. Just this last month, I think, cross fingers, to try to push for a, a, an exchange standard in multicellular models, at least. Because mm. that, I think, is desperately needed there, because I think most of the simulations there are artifacts. Because everybody has a different way of implementing the, the, the model. Mm. And they, they model different time scales and do different time slicing. Uh, there's no way to know whether you've actually converged to a solution or you have an artifact or not. And, and being able to exchange models from tool to tool, you can now finally verify. You will be able to verify that what you actually see appears to be a real, yeah. result, you know, genuine result, not just an artifact of what you're doing. Mm. Um, but, you know, there are areas like biomechanics where there's, I don't know if there are any standards there at all. Um, I mean, there are a, a limited number of simulation yeah. packages that are used. There are packages. Mm. 
but they have but they, I think they're mainly proprietary formats so you can have a struggle to yeah and a little bit different also yeah. so that they're not entirely interchangeable but this is the kind of thing you know the VPH could um, yeah do I think that's a good idea actually I mean it's yeah. it's it, it's you know it's got enough resources behind it and enough credibility that it could mm. really make an impact mm. you know yeah because so. there are uh, I mean when you move to neurological networks then you have yeah. neuron package which is its own universe yeah. so to say and uh, and so on so, so so there are a number of yeah. communities that somehow need to correct come together yeah and it, it could bring them together and try to get things happening i mean the key thing i've discovered about uh standards is community mm. you have to build community yeah yeah exactly it and, work otherwise. and that's why uh, yeah. uh, my goal is not to build a community but to yeah. reuse communities yeah. and maybe put them together somehow. <laughs> but i mean organizations like the uh, vph could could uh, offer grants for workshops and so on to, to start creating the community start yeah. getting people to talk to each other and uh, yeah then in my time. That's why we do two meetings a year. You notice I said we do two meetings a year, one hackathon, one conference. Mm. That is to maintain community. Yep. Uh, and so you young folks in the audience, you are always super welcome at these, uh, at these meetings. So. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, so just we need to finish, but yeah. uh, just to comment on that, actually, uh, th there has been an intent of having a standard for finite element uh, simulations. Ah. So uh, standardizing, so uh, PDEs uh, and fields, it was called uh, field ML. Oh, I know Field it. markup languages. I know it. So created by yeah. Auckland uh, by Engineering Institute with uh, David Nickerson, Peter died, Hunter. Though, I think. Yeah, it almost, yeah, it almost died and uh, They've never been able uh, to create community, actually. So that's that's yeah. an important point. I, I think they were too early for their time. Well, one the of the other problems was not is prepared. they try to do too much at once. And then you never, what's the phrase? Uh, perfection Perfection is the something of the good. If you, if you try to be perfect, you'll never reach your goal. And you'll never make a difference. So it's better to go halfway, you know, not to be perfect and to encompass everything. Uh, but to go halfway, so at least you satisfy probably 80% of the uh, community. Mm. And then you can build from that. So. Yes. so I think we are a little bit pressed by time. So if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. No, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.